Hello, and uh, thank you very much for this invitation uh, to speak at the Al Khan University Hospital uh, Grand Round to the Department of Anesthesia, Critical Care, and Pain Management. And I am really thankful to Professor Asad Latif for providing me the opportunity to make this uh, presentation. I hope I come up to your expectations and uh, we'll answer the questions uh, at the end of this presentation. So as you can see that the topic of discussion today of my grand rounds is artificial intelligence. Uh, do we really need it? So this is a part of a debate that I had at American Society of Echocardiography annual scientific sessions and I took the con side about the utility of uh, artificial intelligence in medicine. And it was a very popular debate, and I've kind of expanded it to medicine in general. And uh, I hope you will like the drift of my ideas. And uh, will <coughs> excuse me, and this will provoke you into thinking uh, differently about artificial intelligence. Uh, these are my uh, disclosures. I make educational materials for both uh, GE uh, medical systems as well as uh, Abbott medical systems for uh, structural heart disease management. So another disclosure that I have is that I own this website known as Boston Cardiac and at the same time a YouTube channel which is again a free educational resource that is Boston Structural Heart. Uh, I would uh, strongly encourage all of you guys to you know, at least visit it, see if you like it. There's a lot of good stuff about education that's related to cardiac anesthesia and cardiology. Check it out and see if you can subscribe it and support this uh, free uh, educational activity. So coming back to the artificial intelligence, so my interest uh, uh, in artificial intelligence started somewhere around 2005 uh, when I was introduced to two engineers from Princeton, uh, Met, uh, Princeton University who were involved in machine learning algorithms. As you can see, I was able to dig out my files from back in 2005. You can see that we have gone through each and every frame of these echocardiography loops to identify uh, various you know, parts of the tricuspid as well as the mitral leaflet, as well as, uh, you know, the aortic leaflet. And then we, you know, expected and asked the machine to track these, these uh, points throughout the course of the cardiac cycle in the echocardiography data that we had uh, acquired. So this was uh, one of its kind, uh, or the first of its kind, uh, uh, artificial intelligence application in echocardiography was very particular. And down the line, about eight to 10 years, it kind of forms the basis of all these automated softwares for these echocardiography companies. As you can see, it essentially started with acquiring data, number one. Secondly, is identifying certain fixed anatomical landmarks within the volume of data. And once you've identified those uh, you know, data points significantly, then you can actually ask the machine to re-identify those things in a newer data that is um, you know, fed into the system. And then you can apply corrections until the time you're certain about its accuracy and it can be made autonomous or semi-autonomous in this data analysis. Now fast forward about 10 years and now all this has become a very uh, important and a very popular buzzword and that's artificial intelligence. And this is, a, this is something which has caught on the eyes of the uh, investment community and hedge fund managers as something that is going to change the you know, world in general and healthcare to be specific. And everybody is talking about it, everybody is pouring a lot of money into it without knowing exactly what artificial intelligence actually is. Do we really have it and do we really actually need it? There are certain apprehensions which are purely driven by Hollywood depictions of uh, you know, uh, artificial intelligence. You all know this uh, movie of uh, the Terminator where that this uh, computer named Skynet uh, becomes autonomous, takes over the world and starts hunting humans. And this all starts from actually this fantastic movie with Matthew Broderick, which is War Games, where a teenage kid inadvertently unleashes a computer to go into an automated TikTok-based, you know, uh, 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 war uh, with the Soviet Union. And that's uh, that's when the computer starts to think autonomously and does and fails to obey uh, the human commands. And the last but not the least of these Matrix series of movies, where it is assumed and it is hypothesized that eventually. We'll all be living in a world which is run by computers in a matrix of data and we ourselves will be the hunted one and the computers will be the predators. Now what that leads to 
is some excitement and which is somewhat real and some is unreal. For the real excitements is all these, uh, you know, industrial robots that we work in, all these assembly lines that have made everything so automated, so smooth and so predictable without significant variability. We have these, uh, you know, automated claim support programs, chatbots, visual analytics of claim settlements by insurance agencies, and above all, the predictive analytics that relate to both the, um, the you know, financial markets, healthcare, and every other industry. But at the same time, we have certain unreal excitement about possibly making robots uh, which are humanoid looking and then be able to do superhuman things, speed and strength and things that we cannot do would be done by them. And some of them are purely fictional and, 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 are, and are far, far removed from reality. However, there is something certainly that is referred to as artificial intelligence. And if historically over the last uh, you know 100 years, if you look at the high points of artificial intelligence, that would be, first of all, is IBM Deep Blue beats the world chess champion Garry Kasparov. Now that was a huge moment when the when a computer could master the 64 pieces of the or the blocks of the chess better than a human does. And then comes the IBM Watson, uh, which in 1990s played the famous television program Jeopardy in the United States and was able to beat the the best Jeopardy player ever by a long shot. And finally, uh, what has been ongoing and just recently concluded is the Mars rover mission over here, which is the rover, uh, which is essentially a bot, which is uh, sent from the Earth to the Mars, was able to successfully land on its own on Mars and was able to operate without any human interaction or direction for over two years. And this was essentially the highest level of you know, machine learning, analytics, and autonomous behavior that can ever be demonstrated, albeit not only just this planet, but actually world away. And that's, that's, uh, that's a huge human achievement uh, by any standard whatsoever. And now we come to this, uh, the famous thing that everybody's talking about now, and that's chat GPT-3, which is essentially a software which is cloud-based and can do and answer any questions for you that you want. Now, there are certain you know, apprehensions regarding you know, a generation of scientific manuscripts that are based on chat GPT. There are certain, you know, people have done ask questions that it has successfully answered for licensing exams. And at the same time, people are beginning to dictate letters and those mundane tasks that are repetitive and do not really need a lot of thought process into it, but essentially repetitive can be used by this free, uh, you know, online or cloud-based artificial intelligence software that recognizes your question, goes through the entire, you know, data, <coughs> excuse me, and then comes up, comes up with the, uh, with good answers, you know. So that's uh, that's the recent excitement for artificial intelligence. However, the most important question to ask in this concept is, what is artificial intelligence? As we have seen that it ranges from chat GP3, the most recent one, which is essentially a software that runs through the data to give you an answer, to, you know, as complicated as making a robot. So th this is classic you know, mis or disinformation that we believe intelligence to extend from softwares to robots, which are purely mechanical, you know, achievements that we need to have to make them work intelligently. So there's a, there's a lot of spread of, of what the expectation uh, from this uh, artificial intelligence are. And there's still, it unsettled what the deliverables are in this situation also. So artificial intelligence is a contested definition. It is supposed to take us to the next level. However, this is not what most people believe it to be. And it is right at this moment in time what we believe artificial intelligence to be is purely a software-based, a program to, to do things that we either take too much time, too complicated, or too boring to do. And the bots or the, the automated robots that would uh, you know, function independently are something that, that, that is still a thing of the, thing of the future and not even, we're not even close to even achieving something that are being claimed right now. So the, the textbook definition of artificial intelligence is that this is the simulation of human intelligence by software-coded heuristics. This is, which means this is a software-coded program that learns by trial and error. And once you tell it what the error is and what, what the, the correct answer is, then it continues to learn, get better with time until it can make these decisions on its own. However, the artificial intelligence is a, is a big umbrella term 
is a program that can cause, that can sense, reason, act, and then finally adapt to the circumstances. It doesn't come on its own, but it does start with something referred to as deep learning. That was what I was involved in in 2005, about 10 years ago. That's a subset of machine learning in which multi-layered neural networks learn from vast amount of data. That is, you identify certain points, then the, teach the machine to identify the same points and build the structure around it. The second comes is machine learning. These are algorithms whose performance improves as they're exposed to more and more data over time. This is the commercialization of those deep learning networks into you know, machine learning algorithms, which, you know, like we say, the chatbots and the neural networks that identify claim analysis and all that kind of stuff. And eventually, artificial intelligence, which does not require any oversight and does not require any intervention and just works on its own to make all these decisions. However, you know, some people are, you know, skeptical about it and some people are a little sarcastic. And then they think artificial intelligence is when you get a college degree, but you're still stupid when you graduate. So it's not necessarily replacing human intelligence as, as we have learned from, from our meager experience into this field so far. And by the end of this talk, I'm sure you'll agree with me what I'm saying. So let's go over the history of artificial intelligence, first of all. And believe it or not, it's older than you think. And it has been going around the block for a while, you know. First of all is the automata, which is in historically a self-operating mechanical humanoids, which have been you know, the fascination of civilizations through history. Automata, they're, they're present in Greek mythology. Automata are, have been depicted during the Middle Ages, during the Muslim Islamic Renaissance. Automata through the Renaissance in, in the Christian world. Then the 18th century automata, the golden age was in the last 100 years, and now we have automata in everything. So therefore, the, 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 the fascination of having, you know, uh, of uh, things that work on their own and are able to do things that we are either unable or too disinterested in doing has been an old historical fascination. And this is not something new that we have, that we have discovered yet. And if I was to, however, call one person as the father of modern artificial intelligence, that would be Mr. Alan A.M. Turing. This is the famous British computer cryptologist who deciphered the German uh, the, um, the Enigma machine so that all German messages during Second World War could be deciphered and led to a significant you know, impact on the Second World War. And he was the first one to ask this question in his 1950 paper that is computing machinery intelligence. That was, can the machines think? And if the machines, he said, would think and are to be found examining how they are commonly used, it is difficult to escape the conclusion, meaning that answer to the question, can machine things, machines think, is to be sought in a statistical survey, such as a Gallup poll. So he was the first person to ask this question rationally, that is it possible that we could have someone uh, create a machine that could think, reason, and, and rationalize like a human does, you know. And that led to his very famous... Uh, Turing test, which was initially also known as uh, uh, the, the imitation game, which is a test of machines' ability to exhibit intelligent behavior equivalent to or indistinguishable from a human. So this is, this is how it was done, that an in, uh, that, uh, that, that observer was sitting in a single room being isolated from a computer as well as a person. He would ask questions to the computer as well as the, the, as well as the human, and based on the answer, they were expected to guess which one was a computer and which one was uh, a human. And that was the imitation game or the Turing test. The test result would not depend on the machine's ability to give correct answer to the questions, only how close its answers resemble those a human would give. And that was a fantastic test. This is, to this day, one of the gold standards of, of you know, using or analyzing the, the quality of artificial intelligence. And he, at that time, hypothesized that in 50 years it will be possible to have extremely powerful machine that can play imitation games so well that average interrogator will have no more than 70% chance of making the right identification. So he, he hypothesized that based on the quality of the data and the quality of the training of these computers, it is going to be somewhat impossible, extremely difficult to see whether you are talking to a human or a, or, or a machine. And just as a trivia, Alan M. Turing was... Uh, you know, a brilliant scientist, but at the same time, he was extremely 
uh, you know, uh, targeted for his sexual orientation because he was gay and he went through a lot of psychological experiments to cure him. And he became so depressed that he was able, he unfortunately bit through a cyanide apple in his home in Manchester and was found dead. And to some people, this uh, apple logo with a half-bitten apple is just a, is just a homage to this brilliant scientist whose uh, you know, fantastic life was cut short by this tragic happening and he died when he was only 42 years of age. So a brilliant scientist, a brilliant life came to a tragic end second to this uh, uh, persecution by the British government. However, going over the, the, the idea of uh, you know, uh, artificial intelligence, the era of 1950 to 56 is, I would divide that as the, when the true ideas began to percolate the scientific world. In 1950, Alan Turing gave the computer machinery intelligence, the famous Turing test, the imitation game that we just talked about. In 1952, Arthur Samuel uh, uh, devised the first program to play checkers. In 1955, John McCarthy in Dartmouth, who was uh, you know, literally uh, labeled as the father of modern intelligence, had the famous Dartmouth conference uh, in, uh, in, in New Hampshire where they gathered the best minds in you know, computational in, in, in engineering to develop and to devise the, the outline of what artificial intelligence should be. And that's where the word artificial intelligence was used for the first time in Dartmouth Conference in 1955. Then comes the era of maturation and a lot of good things happen. You know, John McCarthy creates the LISP, which is a list processing computer that can be taught into making different kinds of lists. Arthur Samuel in 1959 uses the machine learning term. First industrial robot named Unimate is, uh, is developed by General Motors in New Jersey in trying to make assembly line cars. Then we had Edward Feigenbaum and Josh Letterberg create the first expert system. However, the most important uh, a part of this 1957 to 79, the maturation phase, the John Adams, when he created the Stanford cart that you see on the left side over here, was the one which was a card that was based on purely artificial intelligence and could run around the campus of Stanford and could be asked to go from one department to another. And this was a, this was a huge achievement. And in the same year, for the first time, in the United States was formed the Association for Advancement of Artificial Intelligence. Then comes the artificial intelligence boom era. That's when the expert configurated XCON was performed. And 1981, the first significant development happened when the Japanese government allocated $500 million for a fifth generation computer that could translate and could converse. Then there's the, you know, the first autonomous drawing program in 1985. Ernst Dickman created the first driverless car. And the most important development in 1997 was the commercial launch of Electorius, an automated strategy management advising program that put in thousands of pieces of data to guide the business world in making better decisions that are based on predictive modeling. Then came the winter when all the promises of financial kick, financial you know gains from artificial intelligence didn't really materialize, and the, and, and a lot of you know companies pulled back the money from artificial intelligence, and a lot a lot of things happened un, uh, after 1993. Then comes the most important part, and that's the rebirth of AI. That's the deep blue. IBM beats Gary Kasparov in 1993. 1997, Windows releases a speech recognition software. Cynthia Brazil develops the first robot with human emotions. NASA lands two rovers on Mars that operate without human intervention. We talked about it. AI-based focus social media advertisement starts, which is the most dangerous thing of just identifying people who would like to buy certain things and isolating them from everything else and just focusing on advertising things that they like. Then comes the Watson, that means Jeopardy. And lastly, Apple releases, releases Siri which is the first virtual assistant when AI came away from these large, big behemoth computers and came in the hands of everyday consumer in the form of Siri to do things for you on your phone. The current AI is that Google researchers have trained a computer to recognize cats. Big deal. Then Elon Musk, Stephen Wozniak, and Stephen Hawking signed a letter to ban autonomous weapons for war. And we'll talk about this in about a second. The real dangers of artificial intelligence. A human robot, Sophia, is created. Facebook develops two robots to negotiate with each other. Both develop a completely new language to converse and are able to converse and 
engage in a conversation that goes on for hours that no one understands, and eventually they reach a deal, you know. Chinese Alibaba develops a language processing robot that beats human intellect, and finally OpenAI develops chat GPT-3, uses deep learning algorithms to create language and writing-based tasks. And lastly, Dali, a software that can under and, and recognize images. This is the same software that a lot of people are now using to check the quality and the original originality of the images that are produced in medical, you know, literature, which has led to the discovery of a lot of, uh, you know, academic and research fraud. And that's by using this Google-based software, which is Dolly. So now, after having gone through of a history and the development of AI and what its true capabilities are, the question is. Do we really have a problem that this AI solves? Or do we have a solution that for which we really don't have a problem to solve? This is a very important and, and a complicated question that does AI really solve a problem that exists in the scientific world right now? And artificial intelligence in this sense, is it a solution that is looking for a problem? Now this is not the first time and this is this is, happens a, a bunch of times when we are beginning to create solutions sooner than we can develop or sooner than we can discover problems that they solve. For example, a problem is presumed to exist. A solution is implemented. In fact, the problem never existed in the first place. And a solution causes problems that did not exist before. So you create a solution to try to solve a problem that creates more problems that never existed in the first place. So this is one of the best books that I've ever read. And this is called Not in God's Name, written by Rabbi Jonathan Sachs in England. And this is about the unintended consequences of technology. For example, uh, internet and focused advertising leads to focused news and advertisements, leads to your intellectual isolation from alternative narratives and alternative news and alternative sources of information, leads to a significant polarization in the society that we view today. Now, that's an unintended consequence of, and therefore, as a result of that, the paradox of this technology is that we tend to become ignorant despite having more information. We become isolated despite being more connected. And lastly, we have more information, but we have bad information to make bad and catastrophic decisions. This was the same thing with printing press. When the first book that was published the most was Bible, and therefore everybody started making up their own minds regarding the interpretation of religion, religion leading to significant polarization and, and the onset of religion, religious wars in the Middle Ages. And things got a lot worse because uh, before they got a lot better. And before people realized that everything that is in print is not necessarily legitimate and believable. And the same thing needs to happen with internet and inter artificial intelligence. Now, going back to this theme of solutions without problems, let's go over this one, which is the space pen. For example, when NASA started visiting space more frequently, they wanted to have a pen that would be able to operate in you know, zero gravity and so much pressure, sustain so many Gs, and still be able to transcribe you know, impeccably on any paper or any surface that you're able to write. And they put in about $300 million in developing a space pen, which was you know, a gleaming and shining pen that was you know, unveiled to the media of being able to do so many things on the surface of the moon, Mars, space, stratosphere, whatever you want to do. But here's, here's the real situation. Then they realized that a pencil could exactly do the same thing. So they essentially created a solution for which a problem did not exist and spent about $300 million trying to correct it. And going back to the targeted advertising with artificial intelligence, which means once the algorithm figures out what you like and you dislike, it can keep isolating you from alternative information and alternative narratives till you become the dumbest human being in the world. And that's being claimed so so proudly in, in these realms of advertising that retargeting gives you the ability to build and maintain a more targeted audience by analyzing user behavior, browsing history, and other data points. This allows you to deliver personalized ads that are most likely to convert. For, their, for value of these people who are developing these things is conversion of your clicking on that link to buying something. They really don't care how smart you become or how dumb you become as a result of that. Now, having known the development of AI, what its capabilities are, both good and bad, this is a mid-esophageal long axis view of an aortic valve. And it's, as you can see in these three leaflets, there's the interatrial septum, left atrium, right atrium, and the aortic valve, that these leaflets are barely moving. And it's significant aortic stenosis. 
Do you need a billion dollar computer to tell you that this is aortic stenosis? Do we really need common sense or artificial intelligence to say that this is this is aortic this is this is aortic stenosis? So my own personal bias is that we specifically now coming down to the realm of medicine, we do not need artificial intelligence. We need some serious common sense. So now I'll bring the talk and focus it more on the use of artificial intelligence and common sense. And the outline of this, you know, this 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 divergent this digression into uh, uh, medicine is number one would be understanding the AI, the national trends, the healthcare challenges, which are both ethical as well as legal, that relate to informed consent, uh, safety and transparency, algorithmic bias, data privacy, and then we go over the legal aspects of it, which you know concern not the most, you know. So bottom line, the, if you look at the sequence of events that lead to an autonomous behavior, it all starts here. That's data mining, which means this is an algorithm, a sequential process that starts the data mining to developing algorithms that goes to, into classification, learning, neural networks, deep learning, artificial intelligence, eventually leading to autonomous behavior. Now, let me go back. So the key part over here is data mining which means it is a sequential step. And every step that is uh, to follow the first step cannot get any better than the first ones, which means garbage in and garbage out. If your data is bad, every decision, every step is going to further complexify and magnify the error and not make it any better. So the quality of your data collection, the quality of your algorithmic algorithms of data are, are the ones that will make the most, the, the most important Step. So if you have bad data, you'll have, you know, bad artificial intelligence. And the national trends in this one are that the Food and Drug Administration Agency in the United States has so far given uh, FD approval to three softwares. Number one is Iris, which is a medical imaging platform for MRI, which is again based on, you know, algorithmic assessment of the images, then coming up with, uh, uh, with, uh, with a diagnosis, which, like any other screening, you know, technology is essentially, uh, you know, overly sensitive and less specific because it still requires significant oversight. Then we have the the IDX, which is the eye diagnosis uh, uh, software, which is an autonomous screening of the retina of the of, of, of for diabetic retinopathy. And again, it comes up with diagnosis which, without any human interaction. And lastly, is the OsteoDetect, which is detection of you know, even subtle detection of radial fractures, which are sometimes very difficult to, you know, assess, uh, like they're very difficult to diagnose, but even the osteopo oste uh, orthopods have come up with a with a radial fracture assessment tool, you know. However, the amount of money being poured into these artificial intelligence is not an evidence of its legitimacy. Uh, there's, there's a, you know, there's a list of, you know, stupid and bizarre inventions that have made millions of dollars. Each one of these, the one that I list, which starts from Snuggies and, you know, Doggles, which are goggles for your dogs, Koosh Ball, which is just a stress-relieving plastic ball, and a singing fish. Each one of these, you know, incredibly stupid inventions were made commercial and had a business model that, which eventually provided with the people who came up with them in excess of $100 million. So just because of the fact that some people are beginning to pour in a lot of money into something, does not mean it is the right thing to do. It's going to sustain itself over time, you know. Now, this becomes particularly, as opposed to Koosh Ball and Doggles and Snuggies, the, the AI comes with a certain amount of significant, tangible, and very formidable, formidable ethical challenges. First and foremost is the question of informed consent, that when we are using an artificial intelligence-based algorithm, uh, should the patient be informed that the AI is being used in the diagnosis or that real intelligence is not. Because the patient has to know because there is a margin of error and you could just tell that we will not be interacting with this software and whatever diagnosis this software comes out in, we will just go ahead and blindly follow that to its completion. Now that's a significant ethical challenge. Should the patient know this thing? That no human will ever see what my scan says and it says, I have a certain tumor in the breast. It should be a mastectomy is going to be performed regardless of what the human says, you know. So we're not there yet, but that's a significant, all these people, you know, proposing and promoting 
the use of artificial uh, intelligence, you know, uh, without any significant oversight or, Ill, uh, you know, uh, continuous and non-stop use of it, have to answer this question: that should the patients know about this artificial intelligence or the lack of real intelligence in it? The second and the significant important aspect of the artificial intelligence is the black box algorithm, which means even for the people who designed these artificial intelligence softwares, do not know how these deep neural networks interact with each other to come to a certain decision, which means we control the input, but we do not have any control or any idea of how this software reaches this conclusion to give us an output. So we all we control is the input, and then we have an output, or whether or not we believe in it is a completely different issue. So this is one of the most significant problems with artificial intelligence softwares is the black box algorithm or the lack of transparency in how a certain decision was reached. You know, And this is one of the ones uh, in, 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 in Netherlands. This is the Cordy's algorithm to predict cardiac arrest in patients who are having heart attacks. And they would divert the ambulance to a hospital that would have the best chance of saving that patient based on their circumstances, their, you know, their, their vital signs and everything. And, and this, it sometimes would make the most horrible mistakes in sending the patients to, to hospitals that, that didn't have the facilities to even treat uh, in a sim sim simpler patients like that. So in the black box problem, in the process of creation, machine learning algorithms become so complex that they become unreadable except for the inputs and outputs, which means you can only know what you put into it and what you get into it, and, and we have no idea how we got to this decision. So how much should the patient know? I mean, how, how are these things to be told to the patients? Just, this is a software which is based on artificial intelligence. Imagine you're telling this patient, we put in your data over here. I have no idea how this came to this conclusion, but this is the conclusion. You want this patient to believe this thing and go through a treatment process. Now, here's the deal. We've all worked with computers and we've all worked with softwares. And we know when you have Windows Professional 11 Pro you know, software, it stops working or doesn't work as reliably well with a certain hardware unless you upgrade the computer. So these softwares and these hardwares all move at a different pace with each other and their reliability and their function is optimal or suboptimal based on this compatibility with each other. Who would derive that and who would function on that and who would govern that this is the right compatibility to make the right decision? So beware of the black box. So, and, and so just you put in something, uh, you put in a lot of data into it, and then you find out what the answer is without knowing how this answer was reached. You know. So the safety and transparency. Now you realize that the IBM Watson uh, on the left, as you can see, when it beat the, the best Jeopardy player in the world by a long shot, was a great computer. But when the same computer was used as an on oncology detection software or a computer to detect cancer cells in slides and histopathology specimens and in x-rays, it was a tremendous failure to the point that it had to be taken out of service because it was missing so many and was overdiagnosing so many. So therefore, IBM Watson was taken out of its oncology work. It did receive a lot of attention here, but Advent was introduced here, but didn't receive that much attention when it was taken out of it. So therefore, getting one question wrong on a quiz show is, is not a big deal. But missing a cancer in a young patient could be a big deal. So but despite being a supercomputer of millions of dollars worth, it was miserable, uh, miserably low level of diagnostic accuracy. Then comes the algorithmic, fair, algorithmic fairness and bias. Like I said, your, your artificial intelligence is no better than the person who collected the data for the initial assessment of data mining. So if the biases of that person who collected the data will seem to reflect through the whole process and as a matter of fact are going to be you know, magnified. So despite the potential of democratization and globalization of healthcare, there are significant risks of bias and even more so because now we assume since a human is not involved, the bias does not exist. The, 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 the actual facts are quite to the contrary because the initial data collection and, the, and its application are almost or even demonstrate even worse bias than the people who created that. Then comes the data privacy. That, and, and the fact of the matter is that the price of innovation does not need to be erosion of fundamental rights of privacy. Like in, in a royal free uh, breached uh, UK data in 1.6 million patients with Google's DeepMind. And the key part, which I'll tell you that one, is 
despite the fact that it was anonymized data based on triangulation of you know data points from different patients, they were able to exactly pinpoint the name, the telephone number, and the addresses of these patients. And then these companies are in it for not for the betterment of humanity, but for monetization for money. So who owns this data? Who owns this monetization? Who will be responsible when there is discrimination and theft? And do we have the right to withdraw? If a certain hospital wants to withdraw its data, does that change the algorithm of the software? And does it remain as as accurate as it was to begin with? You know. Now come the legal challenges. Now in the 21st century's Cures Act, which was promulgated by President Obama, the AI softwares are even more fast-tracked but they were, because they were given the exemption for medical decision softwares that do not fully fit the medical device definition. So a lot of processes were circumvented in that these processes were you know, shortened or totally eliminated so that people would have you know, greater access to this technology to, so innovators could work with that and we could work develop algorithms to facilitate and simplify our lives. So quite to the contrary, it has actually led to a free-for-all where this, these claims of originality, these claims of you know, superhuman performance of everything have literally you know, murkied the water to the point that we cannot tell fact from f- fiction and myth from reality. And then finally is the liability of these decisions. This is clinical decisions that is derived from an AI-based clinical decision software and results in patient harm. If it's malpractice, who is responsible? Is it the hospital who got this algorithm? Is it the patient, uh, physician, sorry, who, who, who made this, who deployed this one? Or is it the software company who developed this one? So these are, you know, completely, uh, uh, you know, unresolved issues that we have not worked on. And then going back to the data protection and privacy is that our Health Information, uh, Health Information and Privacy Act depends on data de-identification for ensuring anonymity. So, so that de-identified data can be shared frequently, but uh, freely. But this, the data triangulation, as was in the Royal Free Hospital, that the triangulation of data based on who checked into the hospital and what what was the time of admission, what the cars came on into the hospital, and what was their you know license plate number and all this stuff. When all these data are put into it, the programs can be very very uh, you know accurate in identifying the specifics of patient identity and therefore the patient privacy and HIPAA can become quite a myth if we were to use this indiscriminately. Now this is a, a very famous article in uh, IE Spectrum where you know it, it has gone over the fact of seven classic ways that artificial intelligence has miserably failed and we should be very careful uh, before indiscrimin- indiscriminately using AI for anything else. First and foremost is brittleness. For example, take a picture of a school bus and flip it. Most of the time, the AI will fail to recognize the flipped school bus as a school bus because such a failure is an example of brittleness because it can only recognize a pattern it has seen before. If it has not seen that pattern before, it will be unable to recognize that. So AI's brittleness is a reflection of the shallowness of what it learns, which means It is not any better than the data that was put into it. And that's the fundamental principle of artificial intelligence, that if you did not teach it in the first place, it never learned it. The second is embedded bias, which we talked about. Now, this is the most critical, uh, the most, uh, I would say, controversial. For example, in 2019, scientists found in the United States that the nationally deployed healthcare algorithm was racially biased. And the AI was designed to identify which patients would benefit most from intensive care programs, but it routinely enrolled healthier white patients into such programs out of black patients who were sicker because they thought they're going to die sooner, so therefore they're not going to be better for the ICUs. So people with high healthcare costs were also the sickest patient and most in need of care. How did because of systemic racism, black patients are less likely to get health care when they need it. So this is a very important and an alarming aspect of uh, you know artificial intelligence that uh, the systemic bias that it is trying to get rid of, that we hope to eliminate, that we hope to you know, democratize the healthcare across the globe is something which is, which is a far dream and is not possible. Third is catastrophic, forget it. It is that the tendency of artificial intelligence to entirely and abruptly forget information it previously knew after learning new information. Now this is something of an observed phenomena and people haven't figured out how to get around this one that if you teach new information, why does it lead to er- erosion 
or erasing all the older information in these patients. Fourth is the explainability, which is, again, the black box algorithm. This is the way in which AIs reach conclusions has long been considered a mysterious black box. So we cannot explain the inner workings of AI. The future of explainability may involve building databases of correct explanations that are again relates to the inner working, but for a specific decision, the pros and cons of how the various data points are evaluated to bring into a certain a decision in, into clinical practice will not be known anyway. Then is quantifying uncertainty. This is the basis of a Tesla model, S car and autopilot collided with a truck. So because neither the autopilot system nor the driver noticed the white side of the tractor trailer against the brightly lit sky, so the brake wasn't applied, it assumed the side of a truck to be sky and just kept driving it and it smashed into the side of the truck, which implies the, un the quantification of uncertainty because we at some point have that gut feeling that, you know what, it, it, it looks different, maybe I should stop. So that gut feeling, that quantification of uncertainty into making a gut-based decision is something which is missing in AI and cannot be taught. Sixth is common sense. Now that's as, as, as counterintuitive as it seems, but it does lack common sense. So, for example, if AI was deployed to go over these hate websites against the blacks and Jews and other minority groups, now the words that are used on those hate websites are picked up by artificial intelligence and when it is deployed elsewhere, any website, any newspaper, anything that uses those words are again labeled as, you know, hate websites, as hate speech and hate written words, you know. So therefore, despite having a lot of intelligence, it does lack a lot of common sense. And the seventh, which is the most surprising, is that although artificial intelligence is very smart in doing complicated processes, it's horribly bad in mathematics. So because one possibility is that neural networks attacks problems in a highly parallel manner like human brains. Whereas math problems require typical, a long series of steps to solve. So maybe the way AI processes data is not as suitable for such tasks, so that hasn't been worked out as yet. Lastly, let's go back over the artificial intelligence umbrella again. First step one is deep learning. That is a subset of machine learning in which multi-layered neural networks from vast amounts of data. Then comes the machine learning and finally an artificial intelligence is a program that can sense, reason, act, and adapt. I can tell you that most, most of the world, even the most advanced programs, are at the machine learning phase. We are not at the artificial intelligence phase. It's a buzzword. It's a sexy word. That's why everybody uses it. But even the best computers, the best programs in the world, are at the machine learning phase where we're just teaching programs certain algorithms and expecting them to get better with over time as they go along. And if, I have so much in thrill with this one, if there is one, you know, artificial intelligence that has demonstrated at the highest level, that's the Mars rover landing on Mars. And as you can see in this animation, that this, uh, you know, uh, balloon-based, it's a landing craft, lands on the surface. Once it has settled itself, it straightens itself up, and this is without any interaction whatsoever, purely based on the circumstances uh, of, of situational awareness of things around it and making decisions according to that. It straightened itself, opens it up, and then everything else is based on an algorithm and a decision to sustain itself, decision itself to you gain most information, and to negotiate itself through the maze of these rocks and these ravines and these, these cliffs to make good decisions. I'll scrub through this as you can see. If there is an evidence of artificial intelligence, this is what it is when all you can see is that this makes such rational, logical decisions based on its situational awareness, adapting to the <coughs> excuse me, circumstances and making all these decisions. We are a long way from that in medicine, particularly because our, our decision making is based on quantification of uncertainty, common sense, and of, 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 of going through, of eliminating biases in our, in our thought process and getting to the right decision sometimes which are the correct decisions sometimes, which is most sometimes or most of the times based on gut feeling rather than actual hard facts as artificial intelligence would make. So in the end, for decisions that artificial intelligence makes that our computers are made are just faster, they're not necessarily better. And as I said, there's still room for, uh, there's a lot of room before artificial intelligence 
as it is defined as an, a program able to able to adapt itself in learning on the basis of situational awareness and making these decisions. So therefore at this time I would go to give you the example of this Greek mythology of Icarus. This is the gentleman who flew to the sun with wings of wax, his wax melted and he fell down to the ground and died. And this is his father, Daedalus, a mythical inventor created wings made of feathers and wax to escape from Crete, which he and his son Icarus were held captive by King Minos. Icarus, however, ignored his father's warnings and flew, flew too close to the sun. His wings melted and he, well, and he fell into the sea where he met his end and died. The question is, was Icarus a visionary or just stupid? The concept of flying high, exploring the sun, going as high as you could was perfectly fine. But did he really have the wings to do it? That would be stupidity. Although a visionary is his approach, but stupid in thinking that he had all the tools to do that. So therefore, this is an example of too fast an adoption of something which may be not there yet. And the final decision is yours. You would like to follow artificial intelligence or natural common sense. Thank you very much.